Welcome to Dialogue, a true crime conversation. Thrilled that it's yet another Wednesday and another new episode. Today is the last day we are wrapping up our series on Women's History Month and women-centered conversations with women podcasters. And who better to close out this series than the women and crime themselves? Who are the women in crime? They are Dr. Megan Sachs. Well, equity should also be equity of crimes. And what's happening is there's not an equity of the crime by, you know, punishing people saying, you know, you're involved in the same crime per se. It's the same punishment. But that's not equity either. And Dr. Amy Schlossberg. It's less than 10% of exonerees are women. Mm-hmm. And when women are exonerated, it's often for these no crime cases. And it's often for crimes that were perpetuated against a loved one, often a child or somebody else that the woman is caring for. And if you've been listening for any time at all, you know that they are friends of the show. They were much earlier guests in season one. And today is great because we continue the conversation about things that really matter to me that I think are really important and that they are experts in. So it's a really good combination because I get to be curious and they get to give me answers. Megan and Amy are on and we talk about equity in the criminal justice system. Is there equality in the system? And I think the answer might surprise you. So please enjoy my conversation with the doctors. And we reference a couple of things in the show, some specific sources, and you can also check the show notes for some specific references we make to organizations and resources. Additionally, before we get into the interview, I have decided that pending my vaccination, I will be on Podcast Row at CrimeCon in Austin in June. I am very, very excited about seeing my true crime friends and meeting some of you. So if you're planning to go to CrimeCon, let me know. I would love to meet you in person. If you're thinking about going to CrimeCon, check my show notes. There's a link there. If you get your ticket, you can use the code DIALOGUE21, DIALOGUE21, D-I-E-A-L-O-G-U-E-21, and you can get 10% off. So if you're thinking about it, I know there's a lot to consider this year. Definitely use that code for the discount. And if you've decided you're going, do let me know because I would love to meet you. Okay, without further ado, let's hear from the hosts of the Women in Crime podcast, Dr. Megan Sachs and Dr. Amy Schlossberg. I am so excited because Amy and Megan, the doctors from Women in Crime podcast and Direct Appeal are back on Dialogue. Hello, you two. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, thanks so much for having us. Of course. Thank you for being here and for coming back a second time. We have so much to catch up on. So talk about, for anybody who doesn't know, maybe just let's do quick bios on what positions you both so well to talk about these issues you cover on women and crime. Okay, so me, Amy, sorry, I I forget sometimes that this is audio and people can't see me. My name is Amy Sloshberg. I am a criminology professor at Fairleigh Dickinson University. And I have been studying, researching, writing, teaching about various issues in the criminal justice system. Uh, My focus is typically on the causes and remedies of wrongful conviction. I also do some work surrounding reentry and, you know, the effects of incarceration, broadly speaking. I'm Dr. Sachs, Megan, and I'm also a a criminologist, and we both have our PhDs in criminal justice. Mine has a, a specialty in deviance, but Um, I've also been writing, researching, and teaching on issues of criminal justice, criminology, policy reform, um, and other topics in the field for now, God, it's got to be over, I don't know, over like 12 years, something like that. I also worked as a federal probation officer prior to um, getting my PhD, so I have some practical experience that I can draw from as well, and that was in the federal system, so... It it helps, certainly, in what we do. So maybe you could each catch me up on news and updates individually for the podcast. Sure. Um, Well, yes, I saw you as well (laughs) on Talking Evil. I didn't know. I was going to say, you guys didn't know that you were on the same show. I didn't know. (laughs) No, I had no idea. It's like the magic of TV during COVID. I don't know. I recorded that, and then one day it was on. I I feel like everything between that, I had no idea what was happening. So That's pretty cool. So uh, probably like yourself, I'll be in a couple more episodes of Talking Evil. And Amy just appeared on Court TV. Yeah, it was Court TV on Melanie McGuire's case. You were on Judgment with Ashley Banfield, right? Thank you, Megan. Yes, Megan, my publicist. (laughs) 
<laughs> I'm just I'm just her representative yeah. now. No, yeah, Please so direct all inquiries. Yes, exactly. So yeah, it was just the one episode deal. Um, we recorded back in the summer, so it took a little while to wow. air. It was it was kind of cool. I was rocking my tan when it came oh, out. You are very tan. We're also <laughs> working with um we're working with a producer on um some possible crime show development ideas with us hosting. Good. And it's a little premature to talk about that yet, so I'll just wait and come back on your show again. Yeah, absolutely. You will. Uh, open invitation for when that happens and well-deserved because you guys, your show is having such an impact. I think it's such a, uh, I mean, this is a crowded podcast space as you both know, but you found such a niche discussing specifically female-centered crimes, cases, and females on all sides of the stories. So what has that been like? It seems that people are receiving it really well. How has it evolved since the inception of the idea to what it is now? I think we weren't sure if the listeners would be interested in hearing about women trailblazers because that was an idea we had. And we really like to sprinkle those in like the Kathleen Zellner, yeah. the Barbara Ray Ventner. Ventner? Do I always say that wrong? Ventner. Ventner. Is that the, the, is that the genealogist? Is, is that yeah, the, the yeah. genealogist who um, helped in the Bear Brook case? So I, I, I was happy to see that those episodes were received just as well as some of our other episodes. I thought they were. Um, I think one of the things that's been nice and natural is the demand or the engagement about criminological issues, about theory. So the response about the educational part, uh, the learning, like, oh, I didn't know this theory. I'm so glad you covered this. Like, you know, I think the response to kind of the expert side of things has been really strong. And I really appreciate that. Oh, our listeners are very action oriented, which I'm very happy about. We get a lot of what can I do? How can I help? And for me, that was one of the points of this is not just for people to listen, but for people to actually get involved. That's so cool. So what are you, where do you point them? What are your go-to calls to action? They sometimes differ by episode. So for example, you know, if Amy did the episode on Levina Johnson, where there's a petition that you can possibly sign if you're interested, you know, it might be, you know, that you can join a petition. Um, when people ask me in general what they can do about wrongful convictions or justice reform, I point them to some of the, or we point them to some of the notable agencies um, or organizations like the Marshall Project or the Vera Institute, the Sentencing Project. On all of those websites, they actually have things you can do there, um, things that you could do to volunteer for them, or if you wanted to make a donation, or if you wanted to hold like some type of small community kind of educational event. So there's a lot of things people can do. And I think we have a million places we can probably point people. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we tell them, we tell them to vote, yes. vote, <laughs> vote. Vote for your, your local, local level. level. <laughs> yes. That I'm. I mean, I'll shout it from the rooftop every time, and I'm glad when my guests do too, because I honestly think that's been my biggest takeaway in doing this podcast is learning how critical that election is. That local election prosecutor had no idea for the DA how how meaningful that is. I'm attending an all day. It's like pathway to criminal justice in New York State tomorrow, and it's all day, but it's um, about criminal justice reform by a really great organization called It Could Happen to You. And one of their initiatives is called Know Your Rights. Um, so just for preventing wrongful convictions, it's almost like the prequel to wrongful convictions. That's great. Yeah. That's yeah. Great. Yeah. I'm excited. But I'm really glad you're here because I recently learned something and I wanted to discuss it with the both of you to hear your take and perspective because I have a feeling you're going to have some some data and certainly some insight to give it more context. Uh, women and wrongful convictions. Is it true what I recently heard, which was that there's fewer exonerations for women? Now, it's probably, I'm assuming, because there's fewer women incarcerated, but can you talk to me about equity within the criminal justice system in general for women? Uh, where Where is there inequity? And then in terms of wrongful incarcerations, why is it harder to exonerate women, do you think? Why might it be? Okay, so those are... Two very loaded questions. I'm going to start by talking about women in jail. Okay. Because women, most people don't know this, but women are disproportionately represented in our jails. One of the main contributing factors to the high rate of women in jails pre-trial is that women are less likely to be able to afford bail and to pay the fees that are associated with them serving, you know, um, spending time in the community while they're waiting for trial. So I think that is a huge problem because we know that most of these women are mothers. Yeah. 
families that are affected. So more than 60% of women who are in prison have children under the age of 18. And that number jumps to 80% um, when we just talk about women who are mothers in general. So we're talking about really the domino effect that this has on families and communities in general. So that was a later question, but let's ask it now. Is there no special consideration given to a mother, especially if she's the primary caregiver to her children when weighing bail and sentencing? That's all relative depending where you are. And I okay. have to say there's different, there's very much different, there will be differences. If you're, you know, a certain state or certain jurisdiction, they might have no consideration. You did the crime, you do the time. Um, it depends on judges too. You know, I worked in the federal system and that was one of the, it would be like a mitigating factor in terms of sentencing. Okay. Um, but some judges didn't care. They just didn't see that as a mitigating factor, whereas others were much more sympathetic. So I do think, yes, in general, women get more consideration than men in terms of being primary caregivers because they are more predominantly primary caregivers. However, mm -hmm. that is very relative depending on who you're in front of, what jurisdiction you're in, who the voters are. Um, yeah. so it's, not, it's not just easy to say. And, and what about the crime and the charges themselves? Um, okay. So what happens there is, um, well, first of all, this, is, this will be the only time I'm going to say this, but when you're talking about equity, the, the problem for women has actually been in the system, or more recently, more equity. And what I mean, and I know that sounds weird, but what I mean is that women used to be traditionally treated more chivalrous in the system. They were not arrested or prosecuted for crimes that, you know, maybe a male would be per se. Uh, but after the 1970s, you know, it was kind of like women's lib also led to more equal treatment in the system and even harsher treatment in the system because women are being punished the same as their male counterparts for drug crimes, even when they're not committing the same level of crime. So you have, for example, um, a woman whose boyfriend, let's say, is dealing drugs, but he's storing some of the stuff at her house or using her phone to make calls. She's going to be held equally responsible, even though she's not truly equal. Um, also with mandatory uh, arrest policies for domestic incidents, it's now, um, you know, we went through a phase where it used to be that nothing was done, you know, in the 70s, and then mandatory arrest became um, I think, you know, in the 90s, and then it became equal mandatory arrest. So if both parties point the finger at each other, everyone's going to jail. So there's okay. more equality in that way. So I think that's actually and, been a downside for women. And I think this is one of the examples of the unintended consequences of policies. We have these policies that are helping on one, you know, one end of things. And then on the other side, you have it having these, you know, consequences. So I think since like the 70s, the population of women in prison has increased by like 800%. Wow. Really, and I think like Megan said, it's because of these reasons that you mentioned all of that happening over the last few decades. So it's almost like this over response has happened as a result of this historically lower response rate to female perpetrators. And it's like putting all the responsibility on women and almost in this extra, you should know better, almost as a woman, like they're adding more on top of it. Um, maybe because of some preconceived notions we're still holding on to about women behavior and all of that. That's so interesting. There's a second part to that too. And I don't know if this is something you want to cover later, but I can just tell you now what happens with, with women in terms of sentencing how they are treated in the system. In general, women will receive lesser punishments for similar crimes than males. Okay. However, the exception to that is when women commit crimes that violate gender norms. So when they commit crimes that make them bad women, especially against a child or but, something, yes. then they're going to be punished much more harshly because they violated what we see as their maternal or woman female role. Right. And we've seen that play out in countless cases. Um where it's a high profile case and a child was hurt allegedly. And we just demonize, we don't just um, question and scrutinize. We really vilify a woman in that role. Okay. Well, that's, I was thinking about that. I was, as, as I was thinking about equality in the justice system and I wondered if what you said was true. So I'm really glad you clarified about how it used to actually kind of almost behoove women and we almost maybe got away with more, but that's not what we're after either, right? We are after equity, um, but we are looking for like a just and level distribution. Well, equity should also be equity of crimes. And what's happening is there's not an equity of the crime by, you know, punishing people saying, you know, you're involved in the same crime per se, it's the same punishment, but that's not equity either. 
Right, right. It makes it disproportionate punishment for your role in a crime. Yes, right. When Brianna Taylor's case comes to mind um, for her apartment being a location of a cr- connection to a crime. She was I've just- worked on, just so you know, too, I've actually worked on some of those cases. And I remember distinctly as a probation officer, I remember going on, I was on a special um, arrest team for that time. And we had to arrest a mother who was young and she had, they had found, you know, maybe it was a brick of cocaine or something in her closet. It was something, her, it was clearly not her dealing. It was her boyfriend doing it. And she didn't really, she didn't know what the impact was there. And she just kind of was like, am I going to jail? Like, is that, she didn't understand. And yeah. I, I, not only are you going to jail, you're going to prison and you're going for 10 years. And there's nothing, and I didn't say it, but that's what I was thinking. I was like, this reality that's going to sink in is going to be devastating. And I felt bad, obviously, for her small children who were there. Yeah. So getting back to the idea of when it happens that a woman is in prison wrongfully, how about exonerations? And why is it true that it's statistically less likely for us to be able to exonerate them? And if so, why? So only, I I believe the numbers now, of course, the numbers change per year, right? Based on, you know, the new numbers, but it's less than 10% of exonerees are women. Mm -hmm. And when women are exonerated, it's often for these no crime cases. And it's often for crimes that were perpetuated against a loved one, often a child or somebody else that the woman is caring for. So I think we, and what I find very interesting is only 11 women have been exonerated through the use of DNA evidence. So most of the exonerees of women are cases in which there was no DNA DNA evidence. And I think the main reason for this is because, you know, the lack of biological evidence. Yeah. So when men commit a rape, obviously, or a murder even, they're more likely to leave behind biological evidence. So DNA plays a role in only 7% of cases of women exonerees, but more than 25% of cases of men exonerees. Well, also because- You expect to see um, if the if these cases with the women are cases where there's no crime convictions against a there's family no member. <laughs> you expect to see DNA. Your, the mother's DNA is going to be with a child or sure. with your husband or with so DNA yeah. is not going to you know. Whereas with the men and they're strangers, they're committing against possibly strangers. The DNA shouldn't be there. And Absolutely. Actually, a lot of times when you have women who the women who were exonerated with the help of DNA evidence, they're often women who were the accomplice of crimes perpetrated by men. So going back to what we talked about as women being the accomplices, we see that also in the cases of wrongful conviction. But mostly, at least now, as we're seeing these more non-DNA cases come to light, you know, shaken baby syndrome Mm. is a big one. Um, Women that are convicted of, you know, murdering their children. And then later it's found out, well, in fact, it was not arson. It was an electrical fire or a mistake. And then, you know, Sabrina Butler is the only woman um, that was a death row exoneree. And she was exonerated. They claimed that she had murdered her baby. And it turned out he had a medical condition that went undiagnosed. And then Patricia Stallings, that one, there's so many, they're heartbreaking because you have yeah. these women that are grieving the loss of a child. And at the same time, they're being blamed for it. It's just, I, I really can't imagine. With Patricia working. Stallings, they only found out because her second baby had the same condition, correct? I remember course, hearing not this. Not exonerated either. Did yeah. you Did you guys cover that one? Yeah. That's where I heard it. Yeah. How many more must be out there too? Because if you don't have, people that get exonerated are the lucky ones, right? That's the tip of the iceberg. And if yeah. you don't have biological evidence, if there was no crime that was ever committed, you're probably not going to get exonerated. The people that are, the women that got exonerated based on these no crime wrongful convictions, they're the lucky ones. I'm, I'm would be, be scared to know the number of actual innocent people who are sitting in prison right now. But then the ones who are also convicted of killing their kids are the ones who violate gender norms. So people, they're like exactly. the, the worst of the worst, you know, in some eyes of, you know, people and, you know, quotes on that one, but in of society. Wait, you've both have said no crime convictions during this exchange. Can you define that for me? Yeah, a no crime wrongful conviction. So a regular wrongful conviction would be there was a crime, but somebody else did it. Okay. A no crime wrongful conviction is you were convicted of a crime in which it never occurred because the person died of natural causes, an underlying medical condition. Um, I understand. Accident. Yeah. Okay. Accident or something. Like, and those are really heartbreaking. 
Um, we didn't know actually, I, I mean, I didn't know how many there were until we had Jessica Henry on our show. And she pointed out in her work that, um, you know, she does that book, Smoke No Fire. It's mm-hmm. really good. But she pointed out one third of uh, wrongful convictions are no crime. I found that number shocking. But when you look at women, that number jumps up too. It's one third of all. But when you look at just women, that number yeah. jumps to, you know, the majority. Yeah. And so it kind of speaks to our desire to blame a mother for a lot of times a mother for these deaths and to the and and it's played out to the to the nth possible scenario of a conviction and a death row potential conviction i it's astounding i mean we only i I don't even know many men for which that's the case i mean obviously the show we were on was the todd willingham show so it was it's possibly yeah uh, no crime conviction still undetermined but yeah i mean it's definitely much more common for women yep So uh, speaking of women, I have you on specifically on this month because it's Women's History Month. So I'm trying to have a female-focused interview with female podcasters for each episode. Obviously, we've already gotten into one aspect of it, but I'd like to know on a totally different side of things, which woman for each of you is sort of your own personal trailblazer hero in the criminal justice space or in, in... psychology and any work where you are around in your career, who has been sort of the guiding light for you? I I think I speak for both of us when we say Kathleen Zellner is just some, she's just what I would call like untouchable. Anyone who is, you know, uh, there's a wrongful conviction and they say, you know, what do you need? You need Kathleen Zellner. She's exonerated more people than any other attorney in the United States. So for me, I mean, I just think she's Absolutely. Um, kind of one of my own personal heroes. Mm-hmm. Yes, I agree. Obviously, Kathleen Zellner is as good as it gets. Um, but some of these victims of violent crimes who then turn around and become advocates, we've been covering some cases lately where people were victims of such brutal crimes and how they even put one foot in front of the other, let alone, you know, we released an episode today, your episode. Oh, uh, Esther Salas. Or yesterday, sorry, yeah. yesterday. Judge Esther Salas. And, you know, but, you know, her son was murdered and she is now doing amazing policy work, you know, in his memory and getting things, getting things done. I think I would crawl in a ball and die. Yeah. I don't know how people find the strength and move on. When I was younger, I loved Candace DeLong. Have you ever heard of her? No. She's actually on a show now, um, what is it, like Deadly Women? She was kind of a rock star FBI agent and wow. worked on some really significant cases and, one, you know, female like boots on the ground type um, back in the day. And I just thought, she is so cool. Uh, yeah. So I will say she was like, for the practical side, like the law enforcement, like yeah. federal side, I wanted to be like Candace DeLong. Um, That's good that there was somebody then to to look up to. I just interviewed a retired female FBI agent, and sadly, she didn't have any mentors within her agency or department to look towards. And so she made it her own goal to be that woman and to pour into younger recruits and to mentor women. Um, Just along that line, I should have thought of it because it didn't have to be someone famous, but my uh, supervisor when I worked in federal probation was also who I would consider an extreme, like a wonderful mentor. She taught me so, so much. She was extremely intelligent and I did think, wow. Um, So she was really a heavy influence on me in such a, such a good way. Yeah. I think somebody personal in your own life is a, is a perfect answer. I mean, who better than someone who actually informs your work and the trajectory of your career? Um, But I'd like to know specifically Kathleen Zellner, because she's even for all her amazing work, she's certainly she's polarizing, right? Because she's a strong woman who is getting stuff done in a bold way. And I think sometimes defense attorneys in general can get the, I don't know, people just feel wary of them or skeptical or are they bending the truth? Um, Not understanding maybe fully their priorities in the criminal justice system and what their goal is, but Talk to me specifically about what you love about her strategy and how she does what she does. Well, I mean, first of all, she's methodical, like way more so. She pulls apart every detail. She reconstructs every crime scientifically. So I think she's all about the experimental and proving things. Um, I think, you know, I mean, other than just saying she's just so persistent and has had such success, she must be very skillful in interviewing people because she's gotten people to confess to, um, you know, committing perjury 
uh, in, in crimes, you know, related to wrongful convictions that, pol- you know, seasoned police officers and interrogators haven't been able to. So there must be something, you know, very, very wise or, you know, intelligent uh, about her um, interview skills or her communication skills that I think she's able to get people to talk about things that they would not otherwise talk about. What I'm learning about wrongful convictions is that often is the key, is getting witnesses from the past to come forward. And while it's sketchy and people are nervous to believe somebody who says I was was lying then and I'm not now, you know, there's all that brings a lot of concerns. But isn't that a key component to proving a lot of these stories? If there's not biological evidence, you have a, you know very few things to go on. Yeah. Right? If you don't have evidence to retest and you're hoping that someone recants or you're hoping that somebody comes forward and confesses to something or admits to something. Um, you're really working with so little. Right. I don't think it's surprising, though, when you find out later on, like at this point, um, it's no surprise that jailhouse snitches lie. I cannot believe we still use, like, I cannot believe that is an acceptable practice to use jailhouse well, snitches. Well, a lot of states now, thankfully, they they require corroborating evidence if you have a snitch or they require, it's kind of like a Brady violation. You you know, you need to tell the defense, not only has this person been an informant before but exactly what incentives they're getting and that hasn't always been the case like there used to be a point where i don't know how it wasn't considered a brady violation when the prosecution didn't have to tell the defense if their witnesses were incentivized right right and i think that's what we keep seeing come undone because so much happened in a way that it wasn't supposed to happen witnesses were misled and manipulated by law enforcement and that has led to oftentimes the wrong person being convicted and so a conviction is based solely on that. Or, right, right. Uh, or witness testimony, which we also know is, is unreliable at best. Today's episode is presented by The Skin Store. For over 20 years, The Skin Store has been the number one destination for premium skincare, hair care, and beauty products. With over 8,000 different products from 300 different brands, The Skin Store has you covered for all your hair, cosmetics, supplements, and of course, skincare needs. Find your favorite brands like Elta MD, New Face, Olaplex, and more all in one place with gifts with every purchase. I have to tell you, my skin is so sensitive, I had to go to my dermatologist for testing to find out what I was allergic to and what I can and cannot have in the products I use I was so excited to learn the skin store has all the brands my dermatologist recommended so I can safely and confidently shop there knowing everything I'm going to choose is going to be okay for me. Right now, the skin store is offering dialogue listeners 20% off your next purchase by using the code POD. That's an easy code, right? POD, P-O-D for 20% off your next purchase. Just go to skinstore.com slash pod dot list. That's skinstore.com slash pod dot list. Skin Store, have the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Some exclusions may apply. Speaking of women who are, we'll just keep with the theme of polarizing and people have strong opinions about, Lori Vallow is a case that's so complicated that, you know, Dateline, when they did the episode, had a Venn diagram to show all the pictures and the movement and the connections, which a visual is almost needed, you know, when you're just getting your head around that case. I wondered if I could hear both your thoughts on on Lori, you know, in terms of a profile, if you could put your like criminologist hat on and talk about that. And we can talk about maybe what we might see in the coming months of the trial. What are, what are your thoughts on her and the case? I mean, Lori Vallow reminds me of, you know, she's this otherwise law-abiding citizen, a normal mother, or by, by most descriptions, you know, she was just kind of um, a normal person who seems to have dissociated from reality in some way. I wouldn't be able to speak like specifically to her, I wouldn't say mental illness, although I have a feeling that that's what's going to come to play at her trial. She seems to have definitely had some type of unreality going on where she did become convinced that her children were, you know, they say zombies, whether or not she believed they were zombies, I think she did come to believe that there was something wrong with them and they were bad and that she had to get rid of this bad. Now, to what degree this was utilitarian versus delusional, 
I'm not sure. I really want to see the evidence at trial before I'd make that. But I think what you're going to see happen at trial is one of two things. A, you're going to see a strategy where they blame her brother and they try to put all the blame on him. He was the crazy one or he, this was his idea or, you know what I mean? Like he's gone and he, there was some involvement clearly by him at some level. So I think smartest thing is throw him, you know, the doubt on him or the secondary would be, she goes for um, some type of insanity plea, but I don't. I mean, an insanity plea is actually what I think makes sense for her, to be honest, if she was this delusional about her children and if she came to believe that they were otherworldly or possessed in some way. I don't think she's going to do that, though. I think her counsel would try to convince her to do that. And I think that's the smartest route for her or, you know, not having reviewed everything yet. But those are my two predictions. And I guess, like I said, I, I don't know to what extent she is bad by intention or by some type of outer influence or by her own, you know, I don't know to, I would like to know to what extent she's truly delusional. I don't know her case as well as you do, Megan, to be honest, but wasn't there also something that she believed that like a doomsday was coming? And there yeah. Was like- well, those are my, that was my question is where do her religious beliefs, which border maybe into cult territory come in, in terms of insanity and how does that influence it? Cause yes, she did. Yeah, because there's, a, I think there's a fine line between extreme religious beliefs, cult participation, and mental illness, delusional. Yeah. Beliefs. Really, that's why I'm with you, Megan. Like, I have trouble really saying what I think about this case because I don't think we, I don't think we have any idea the evidence that is going to be presented. I think we're going to find out a lot about her mental health and. I think so too. And I don't know the extent to which Chad Daybell is also delusional or not. This could be a case of shared psychosis for Mm. all we know at this point. I mean, this could literally be shared delusional disorder. And that doesn't mean that every cult, you know, I do think cults, you know, but that doesn't mean every cult member is delusional as well. You know, certain cults are just functional or utilitarian or whatnot, but I don't, Until we know the full, I I really want to see some clinical diagnosis here of her, which people are speculating, but speculation is not going to be enough in this instance. Megan, I know you know more about psychopathy than I do. Do you think she falls under female psychopathy? Because I've heard that floating around. Well, so you know what's interesting about psychopathy is that the only diagnostic tool really for psychopathy is the hair, the PCL hair checklist, but that was only constructed on males and it's only been tested on males. And so it's in appropriately and incorrectly applied to females at time. Like they use the hair scale for Eileen Warnos and said she was psychopathic, but you were never supposed to use that scale to apply to women. And she wasn't actually technically psychopathic if you had looked at um, other criteria. So, I mean, if you're looking at the male criteria for it, I don't really know that Lori Dalla would meet it quite yet because there's, there are a lot of criteria that on the surface, she actually does not fit. I've, I've, seen some studies and you're right the hair scale cannot be used for females but there I've seen data that suggests that female psychopaths are sexually promiscuous so they have a lot of failed relationships and I do think she fits into didn't she have five marriages she had a lot she had a lot of marriages (laughs) what is the hair scales I've not heard that so Robert Hare was a psychologist who basically developed a 40 point criteria by which you could or a 40 point scale by which you could tell um, if someone was psychopathic. And I mean, you have, there's a lot of questions to measure each dimension, but some of the, you know, factors that you're going to see with true psychopathy um, or really antisocial behavior are going to be extreme manipulation, living a parasitic lifestyle, causing, you know, harm to others or no sympathy for others. You know, uh, a criminal history is part of that category as well. Promiscuity or failed unstable relationship on unrealistic long-term goals. So she I, she does fit some of the criteria, certainly, but not all. It's, does she not also fit the profile of a female serial killer? You mean profile or would she qualify as one? What, like, Well, there, well, how many people has she killed? I know that's up for debate. Uh, but it's up for debate, but if you want to, I, you would, if you assume that she had something to do with her, her husband, husband yeah, and maybe his, his wife possibly and her Two children. Two kids. And, yeah. At least I mean, four. By, de- by, by the numerical definition, she would fit the profile. The you reason I, mean? I say that is female serial killers, typically their victims are going to be people they know, husbands, children, people that are vulnerable. And so she kind of fits that profile a little bit. 
She would fit in terms of like, yes, it's a female that usually kills someone that they know. Um, it's a utilitarian crime, but I don't know if she's delusional. That's not usually. So while most serial killers, people go like, oh, they're insane. They're psychotic. They're actually not. They have severe personality disorders, but severe mental illness is actually pretty rare among us. Uh, huh. But why can't you apply the hair scale to women? What makes it a gendered thing? Because it was only constructed using male qualities. I see. So we don't know if those same qualities, if they're tested and replicated over again, would hold true for women. I, that's so interesting to me because it's sort of engendering characteristic traits of a person. So are we not in an era of like post? I don't know. Is that? Are there trait differences? Yeah. Uh, differences yeah. or, you know, I don't, you know, the, the truth is that I can't answer that question. I think that, that you will find there, there are going to be different traits for female psychopaths versus male psychopaths. And I think if you find that their crimes they commit are going to be different, their, vic their victims, their targets are different. And some of their, you know, modes are different Then there's probably going to be probably. Yeah, I really couldn't say for sure on that one. I wouldn't even want to venture, you know, my best guess because I, I truly don't know. I think there's some qualities, though, that would hold uniform, you know, sure. Like, um, you know what I mean? Like extreme manipulation, lack of remorse. These things I think you would find solidly mm -hmm. throughout men and women. Lack of empathy. Yeah. Maybe you both could develop the female scale, the yeah. Schlossberg Sachs scale. I like it. The <laughs> <laughs> we could workshop it here live. I'm totally fine with that. <laughs> yeah, I like, I like that. that. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. So Lori Vallow kind of represents cases that we've talked about even in our first conversation. There's a lot about it that we are drawn to because probably she's middle class, seems like a suburban mom. And so naturally, media is going to feed it to us because that's who we like to hear about. Who are some lesser known female offenders that you're intrigued by and again i'd like to hear your thoughts where you are now on why we don't hear about all of them in equal measure most offenders are going to choose victims that are within their own race and within their own social class so i think the same way we tend to ignore marginalized victims we're ignoring the marginalized offenders who victimize them i think I, I mean, that's definitely true. I think so. Look, the cases that fascinated us, uh, fascinate us, yeah, they're mostly going to be white, um, upper class, also uh, good looking. I yeah. To say it, but yeah. The, attract the attractiveness factor plays in really like what people looking at it because they look so nothing like, you know, maybe the monster that we perceive. Like Melissa Huckabee killed a small child. I mean, this was a really egregious crime. And yet so many people hadn't heard of her and I hadn't heard of her. And she committed a sexual offense against the child. Wow. I mean, the, the whole thing was very, very rare. Like you'd almost never hear of this kind of crime, but she got very little coverage. And I'm going to tell you, it's because she was average looking and she was lower class. They lived in a mobile home park. So mm -hmm. I think people just didn't care as much. It wasn't as interesting. It's not as salacious. Um, I know I that know. another case, Sheila Davalu, she um, killed possibly two people. She was, now she was an Iranian immigrant and, you know, she's, I would say intelligent, but also possibly, again, she was an immigrant. I'm not sure if that played any role or not, um, but, you know, it just wasn't as hyped up as the cases that involve to, you know, the kind of really, really like upper echelons. And I really do think that a uh, serious like attraction plays, you know. A role in Lori Vallow's case too. You've got the cult aspect. So when you have yeah. that aspect too, I mean, it's the trifecta. Yeah, yeah. The trifecta. yeah. The attractiveness piece seems to apply to victims and perpetrators, right? It does. Like, and also celebrity, wealth, and and good looks seem to be things we are especially interested in. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I would say that like all the time. Uh, yeah. That's my, my number. Seriously, my number one answer is look at look at what they look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really kind of heartbreaking, actually, especially on the victim side. Well, of course it is. Yeah. yeah. On the, I mean, on the victim side, this was the yeah. reason, the reason why you didn't hear for so long um, also about, you know, when I covered in serial killers about, Amy was right, about black serial killers is because their victims were usually poor black females and society just did not pay as much attention to them or their offenders. Yeah. And so can you talk about the shift? Because I feel like it's changing. I feel like it's gradual. And I feel like it's happening because of independent 
content creators like yourselves and other shows that are really taking the time to explore past cases that did not get national media attention. So have you seen that shift and what other trends do you see in true crime? I see that shift, but not as much as there should be because a case like Lavina Johnson is one of the worst cases I've ever heard of. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but how is her case not blasted on every single documentary? Yes, there have been a few podcasts that covered it, but if that was a white woman oh, God. Be on the evening news every night, every single documentary. So I think it's, you know, yes, we might be moving in the right direction, but we have a long way to go. Yeah. I, I mean, I really agree with Amy. Like, I, I definitely think we're trending in a better direction. I definitely see more attention being paid, more media, but I still think the most popular media is going to involve the, the, you know, who we've always, you know, been interested in. And Rebecca, I'm sure you've heard this as well because of some of the guests you've had, but the people who consume true crime are, you know, the demographic of middle class white women. And we know that people like to hear stories that resonate with them and shows. We even spoke to a producer and they said they get much better ratings when they have a middle class white woman as a victim than when they have someone from a marginalized group. And that's just the sad reality of it. For whatever the reason might be, who knows what the reason is, but that's what it is. This comes up on dialogue a lot, and it, it kind of sickens me because I feel like it's a which came first, you know? Is it our collective societal preference to see ourselves reflected in, in the stories presented? And then they're just kind of feeding us what we're consuming because things like ratings. But I don't, I don't, are, are there, is there real data on the true crime audience being white? I know it's very female. And, and is that just a position of privilege that I guess we can for entertainment, yeah. explore true crime? I read an article and I wish I could cite it, but I don't recall, but it was written by a woman of color who said she is scared in her everyday life. She doesn't need to listen to true crime podcasts to get that high, so to speak. Yeah. Oh, and that really like hit me in the gut. Every, I know. Definitely know there's data too on the shows for sure. Like even our own data, we've collected data on our own oh. audience and it's, it's, it's definitely your, you know, 25 to 45 women educated professional mm -hmm. and and I can tell you that holds true with a lot of other podcasters who I've spoken to and I'm sure you would know anecdotally as well you know what I mean but yeah sure. I, think the, I think the data is generally going to be supportive of that and there are some podcasts that do focus on cases that are specific to marginalized yeah groups and I don't think they do as well as other podcasts unfortunately I think you're right. And I think that's also a place where the community can kind of share platforms and help elevate other shows like that. Thanks for kind of exploring that with me. I know we didn't plan to. Your start to podcasting was with Direct Appeal. Are there any updates from Melanie McGuire? Speaking of middle-class white women, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Melanie is, you know, still in the appeals process. She's, you know, it's hard because she was already in her federal habeas, which, you know, is like outside of the state. So she's exhausted all the state appeals. Um, she has a new lawyer. She's got a great lawyer, actually. And so he is working, you know, various different angles. I can't really discuss too much of the legal strategy sure. that he's got going on. But it's still going to take a while in terms of any real updates. No one else has confessed to killing Bill. I can tell you that right now. Yeah. Uh, but there's still a lot of interest in Melanie's case. But I wouldn't say there's anything to like talk about developments. Not, not quite yet developments. Do you think she deserves a second trial? I think she has some good appeal, uh, appellate issues. And based on the appellate issues, I, I do. I would love to see her get another shot at it based on that. Okay. I agree. I think. I think everyone should get another trial that appeals for one. I know that's not possible and that would clog the system. But wow, yeah, that's... I know that's a little bold, but I definitely think in Melanie's case, there were enough issues at the trial that she deserves a do-over. Okay. On the record, we'll keep watching and waiting, I guess. In the meantime, we are also working on Direct Appeal Season 2 and 3. Tell us everything. Can you tell us the Season 2 case? Or not yet. Uh, I, I'm not going to reveal the name yet because we're still working, but I will tell you it is a male. So oh. we took on a male's case this time okay. and it involves a possible no crime conviction. 
Cool. Murder. Full full circle. Will many people know the case, do you think, or will this be kind of a discovery for most? Half and half. If you're into true crime, you probably have seen something. You've probably seen a dateline on this one. Okay, okay. But it's not Lori Vallow where everyone in the world is going to know it. So some people are going to know it and some people it will be new. It hasn't been covered so extensively that it's saturated. Let's put it that way. Okay. Rough time period of the crime. (laughs) I'm just going to get as much as I can. Oh, uh. 2000s, yeah, yeah, about de- about 10, 10 or so years ago. Okay, so pretty recent. Yeah, we're still in the modern day. Okay, okay, good. And so when- we're working on that one. When do you think that will debut? So I th- we think that one's going to debut, I think probably fall to be realistic, like early fall, like cool. September, or maybe even the end, well, yeah, probably September. Um, and then we're releasing another podcast in April or May, and that one will be on serial killers, serial offenders. A whole, like a limited series or another? It'll be a limited series, uh, probably a 10 to 12 parter. Wow. Um, where we actually look at um, or talk about really the motives, the causes, the types of offenders. Oh my gosh. Biological drives, all these types of things. And we speak to experts on serial offenders. And we also spoke with a couple serial killers for it. So people are going to love that. People love serial killer talks. Well, that's really exciting. I love how podcasting, you guys have just taken to it and you're running. I I love seeing it. I want to keep up to date with everything you're doing. And I thank you both for being back on, but I do have to ask both of you before you go, I'm actually about to change this question on dialogue. So you might be one of the last people to answer, but what is keeping you up at night? Fear of an acid attack. Acid? Yep. Like someone throwing acid on you? Yes. Oh, that's terrifying. That is scary. Wait, terrifying. Tell her why. It's not. <laughs> so, do you know my answer was about to be the same thing just because, because it, Amy's covering? Uh, so, okay. one of the cases that I've been researching for an episode of Women in Crime has haunted me like no other case has ever haunted me. I guess I just never really knew much about these types of cases. I haven't studied them much, and it really just threw me. I shared some with Megan too, and Megan's not okay with it either. No, yeah. We don't usually talk about the cases ahead of time, but this one we had talked about for a couple of reasons that we had to, but it's it kept me up. I feel like not well about it either, and I'm really looking forward to like covering it and moving past it. Yeah. Also, the thought of serial killers keeps me up at night killing me, but that's because I'm interviewing people for my show. That tracks. <laughs> that makes sense. Um the the throwing acid thing, and I, I, I know we don't want to dwell on it. I'm sorry that that's keeping you up at night because it truly is a, such a violent, horrific, unexpected. Um, I just was like, wow, I I'd never thought to be scared of that before. Like, great. Exactly what we said. Add it to the list. Yeah. I'm like We're like walking like outside. I'm looking at everyone. Yeah. Like, no one's going to throw acid on me and run. I, this is such a ridiculous thing to be thinking about. Yeah, it, it reminded me of when I moved to New York for college in the late 90s when the box cutter on the faces was happening like all the time. And basically I was convinced I would get slashed in my face. But that's like a known thing. I don't know. But when I heard acid, I was like, what? Like would never even think about it. So I get that. And I'm sorry. Sorry, I hope I didn't just put that in everyone else's. <laughs> this will be a really good one to end with this question with. Be like, and that was the last time we ever asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> I really think that's a good idea, Rebecca. <laughs> it is finished. Well, thank you both. I can't wait to watch from afar or close by. I hope I see you this year. Thank you for having us on and congratulations on your new show too. Thank you so much. It's fun and I love having a co-host. That's something new that I'm really enjoying. So thank you. Dialogue is a Yellow Tape Media production edited by Jason Usry and produced and hosted by me, Rebecca Sebastian. Please be sure to subscribe to Dialogue, a true crime conversation, wherever you listen to podcasts and follow us on social media. We are at Dialogue Pod across all platforms. You can also drop me a note or a guest suggestion or sign up for my newsletter at RebeccaSebastian.com. Be sure to join me every Wednesday for a new episode and another killer conversation.